All right, Jerome Powell is going to be speaking in the next five minutes. Let's go ahead and see how the market reacts. What's going on, team? It's Ricky with TechBud Solutions. I really hope that you guys enjoy today's live stream. Um, and if so, please consider dropping a thumbs up and subscribing uh, if you end up feeling like we earned it. So uh, remember, I do live stream every single morning right at Market Open. Uh, I hope uh, share my trades. I uh, break down a series of different stocks it is that our group members see value in. If you ever want to tune on into these live sessions, especially if you're trying to do this on your own and you think that it would be useful to be able to watch someone do it, um, we'd love to have you. It's the second link in the description down below if you want to learn more about how to access those daily live trading sessions. So, all right. Just going to wait. Um, we have about four more minutes left until they actually launch... Um, this live stream. So it's going to be today at 1 15 PM Eastern's time. Uh, and that should be in the next four minutes if I'm not mistaken. So Ricky House physical therapy. Yeah. I just got back. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's going right. So just working on my hand recovery, but, um, let's talk about the market very quickly. Is that cool? Overall NASDAQ market, uh, slightly in the green, but for how long, right? A lot of consolidation. We still do not have confirmation of a reversal. I'm looking at this on the 30 minute time frame. We sold off very aggressively yesterday due to uncertainty of the inflation report that was reported last week, but also because of the attacks on Israel, right? From Iran. Uh, we could see that, you know, there was uncertainty because, you know, is Israel going to retaliate according to what we know now? So right now it's, it's a no, um, but if something does end up happening, obviously things can get a lot worse before they get better. Uh, what we're really looking for today, um, yeah, so L price action today. I completely agree with you. Brandon, you would, you would think that today probably would have been a more active day, especially knowing what happened yesterday. Uh, but this just to, is to show you that the market's very uncertain of what's going to happen next. Not you, not I, not anyone in the market right now uh, knows what's going to happen overseas, right? If they attack, markets are probably going to drop. If things don't actually get worse, then we can begin to see the market potentially recover. At the end of it, that means that you are given two opportunities to go long or to go short uh, based off of how direction ends up presenting itself, right? Stay patient, stay calculated, and please don't just enter a hopeful position thinking something has to happen when it definitely does not. Um, Jerome Powell, the kind of like the focus that we have for today is his confidence in remaining and staying the course in cutting interest rates in 2024. There was the idea that was planted of potentially raising interest rates because inflation is not just not going down, it's actually going up. Um, but again, Jerome Powell, just we've we've done a, a few of these live streams. Um, Jerome Powell doesn't normally give us too much uh, info during these speeches, but we'll see. Maybe this time it's a little bit different. Maybe he can talk about him not being a fan of the most recent economic reports with the CPI data report. Um, or maybe he says something that he's like, hey, no, like, yeah, it went up higher than what was expected, but we're still confident that we're not going to raise interest rates and um we could see a potential rate cut, you know, next month or whatever the case might be. I think the next rate decision, if I'm not mistaken, is um, early May, right? If I'm not mistaken, it might be May 1st, actually. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll see what he ends up saying. The market will react and we will capture that market's reaction. So sit back, relax. Uh, we're going to tune on, uh, turn that live stream on in the next one minute. So hopefully they end up uh, sharing the link with us. So here it goes. Hopefully that we um, we earn your thumbs up. And again, if you have any questions, feel free, uh, feel free to participate in that live chat. You do have to be subscribed to the channel to partake in that live chat. So, all right, I'll shut up now. It has to be a relationship with Canada. Now, a lot of the discussion about the U.S.-Canada relationship tends to focus on its importance for Canada. Trudeau the Elder's famous comment about uh, sleeping with an elephant. Uh, but Canada is our largest export market, almost 20% of everything that we in the United States send abroad into this world of 8 billion people goes to the 40 million people in Canada, who are only one half of 1% of the world. It is the largest and most comprehensive two-way economic relationship among any two countries in the world. The evolution of the energy economy of global importance will be heavily influenced, perhaps determined, 
by decisions that our two energy producing nations make. We have a unique role in being advanced financial economies, using a lot of energy, but also significant energy producers, and can balance the effects on economy and society of the choices that we make. And on top of that, Canada is a key US ally in the international financial architecture. I've spent three different tours of duty in government service where a big chunk of my job was international financial diplomacy. And we could always count on the Canadians being sane, solid, and punching way above their weight. And yet the US tends to take it for granted. And my experience in life is that the good things we take for granted, we tend to mess up. So my hope is that with this series of events, we can be part of helping focus folks in the United States on the importance to the US of this relationship by finding speakers and topics that will have a very broad appeal beyond the usual suspects who focus on our uh, relationship with Canada. And we certainly have that with our event today, which includes three of the most significant economic leaders of our two countries. Bill Murnau, our moderator today, is, well, when you look in Wikipedia under Renaissance Man, there is an inset photo of Bill Morneau and nobody else. <laughs> uh, recognizing his significant achievements across politics and policy and business and philanthropy, he's the former finance minister of Canada, playing a key role in shaping sustainable economic policies of the Trudeau administration, including Canada's economic response to COVID-19, and a key reason for Canada's aforementioned above weight punching in the international diplomacy, as a business leader, he grew the multinational human resources firm Morneau Shepnell from a family business to over 4,000 employees and the largest human resources provider in Canada. As a philanthropist, he's worked to support the arts, help at-risk youth, improve access to health care and education all around the world, including founding a school for Somali and Sudanese girls in a UN refugee camp in Kenya. And as a policy thinker, in addition to his role chairing this Washington Forum, he's chaired the C.D. Howe Institute, a leading Canadian think tank, and has written Where To From Here, a policy book that I assure it is several cuts above the typical former official's post-service book. I put it up there with Robert Rubens in An Uncertain World. Anyone who has ever served in any government of any country at any level at any time will immediately recognize the honesty and intelligence and savvy that he's brought to thinking about the lessons of his time in office uh, for the issues facing Canada. And all of us, I highly urge all of you to read it. Tiff Macklem is the governor of the Bank of Canada and another of the reasons for Canada's substantial above weight punching in the world. In addition to his role as governor, he's the chair of the group of governors and, and heads of bank supervision. That's the oversight uh, body of the Basel Committee, rather high profile these days. And he is co-chair of the Financial Stability Board's regional consultative group for the Americas. He's a distinguished economist, having headed the most important division of the bank's economic staff in the early 2000s, having played a critical role in Canada's response to the great financial crisis uh, in his post in the Canadian Finance Ministry in the mid-2000s. He's been a senior deputy governor of the bank from 2010 until his appointment as governor. He's also been a distinguished academic, having served as dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And our final panelist is Jerome Powell, chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. It is a weird task uh, to introduce Chair Powell. It's like introducing Henry Kissinger. How do you do it without looking absurd? His doctoral thesis on Metternich received very high marks. Uh, so just let me say this. There is an anteroom off the main boardroom in the Eccles building, which is the Fed's true headquarters building. They're currently slumming it in an annex, uh, where the portraits of all the Fed's chairmen hang. And as you look around them, it is borne in on you that none of them will have been as consequential across as broad a range of matters as Jerome Hayden Powell in managing the remarkably low inflation and high employment of the pre-COVID period in the world historical response to both, a, both nationally and globally to the COVID event, in the first major review and, ex, and explanation of a formal monetary policy framework for the Fed, and in managing the quite effective response to the most significant inflation in almost half a century, but one in which many of the traditional guideposts could not be helpful, requiring very creative thinking and deft management of the extremely well-meaning but hydra-headed body that is the Federal Open Market Committee. So with that, let me thank you again for coming, and let's turn to our panel. <clears throat> well, I want to start by thanking you, Randy, for, uh, for both for that uh, very, very generous set of introductions, and also for your willingness to step forward as the co-chair of the Washington Forum on the Canadian Economy. So we uh, 
very much appreciate your esteemed leadership and uh, one of the key reasons we're here today is is due to that so really appreciate it I'll just say personally one of the things I like most is you said Canadians were sane so uh, that's a pretty good starting point I think for our discussion here today uh, so with uh, with two esteemed panelists I won't really be speaking much I want to give both of you gentlemen an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about your respective economies and I guess also recognize that we're here to talk about the Canada-US relationship and, and what is both distinct and, and uh, different about our economies, but also what we share. So maybe with that, I could start with you, Governor Macklem, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk to uh, Governor, or Chair Powell. Governor well, thanks, Powell. Bill, and, and uh, I think you better call me Tiff. Um, <clears throat> it, it is a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you and Randy for, for launching this, for inviting us both. Uh, I am very pleased to be here to say a few words about the Canadian experience, and I always enjoy uh, comparing notes with Chairman Powell. Now, as Canadians, we invariably compare ourselves to Americans, and maybe it's human nature, but we, we tend to focus uh, on the differences. We've got different systems, systems of government. We, we're bilingual in Canada. We have three down football. Uh, and, and we even, we even have very colorful polymer banknotes. Uh, and and uh, certainly our, our climates, uh, I think, are, are uh, certainly uh, the IMF meetings are always a welcome uh, first blast of spring for the Canadians. Uh, our, Can our, our economies obviously have much in, in common, but again, we, we often focus on the differences. If you look at growth in Canada and the United States over the 20 years leading up to COVID, remarkably, it was the average was exactly the same, average 2.2% in both countries. The sources of growth, though, uh, have been a bit different. In Canada, we've grown more by adding workers. Our participation rate has risen more, and we've had proportionally higher rates of immigration. In the United States, adding workers has also been important, uh, but increasing output per worker or productivity uh, has made a relatively larger uh, contribution. And, and I will admit in Canada, we look at U.S. productivity growth with some envy. Uh, and we do ask ourselves, I mean, what can we learn from the U.S. experience? We, we are concerned about productivity growth in our country. Turning to the financial system, we both have strong banking systems, but the structure of our, our banking systems is quite different. In the United States, you've got a lot more banks than we do in Canada. Uh, in Canada, we, we have um, uh, five lar large uh, national banks and a number of important regional players. The structure of our mortgage market is also somewhat different. In Canada, the typical mortgage is five years. Uh, in the US, typical mortgage is, uh, has a term of 30 years. And our banks in Canada tend to hold mortgages on their balance sheets. Uh, US banks securitize a lot of their mortgages. Despite these differences, our systems are very integrated. Uh, and indeed, um, a number of large Canadian banks have large operations here in the United States. Our pandemic responses were also mixes of similarities and uh, differences. You know, broadly speaking, the the paths of our two economies were pretty similar. Um, we we both cut interest rates uh, very dramatically to effectively zero to support the economy through the pandemic. Uh, then we both raised them very forcefully as inflation rose rapidly, and we've both seen inflation come a long way back. Uh, growth has been more resilient in the United States, though, through this, this tightening cycle, and I think that's partly related to the stronger productivity growth I mentioned in the United States. And it may also be re related to the fact that monetary policy may be having a bigger impact on households in Canada because of the different structure of our mortgage market. More of our mortgages have reset in Canada, so more people are feeling those higher interest rates. And that, you know, that has restrained household spending more in Canada. Uh, you know, in each of our countries, I do want to underline that you know, we're, we gear our policy decisions to our domestic monetary policy mandates. And in Canada, we have our own currency, we have a flexible exchange rate, so we can run uh, our own monetary policy. So uh, simply put, you know, we, we don't have to do what the Fed does. We can uh, do what Canada needs. I do think, though, we're looking at the same things and asking ourselves the same questions. Uh, I think we, you know, we both need to feel confident that we're clearly back on a path to 2% uh, before uh, it would be appropriate to reduce interest rates. 
Last week in Canada, we held our policy rate at 5%, where it's been since last summer. We did stress that we are encouraged by the recent progress uh, we've seen on inflation, and we want to see it sustained. And just this morning, Statistics Canada published the March CPI. As expected, headline inflation came in close to 3%. We have seen gas prices in both our countries move up. Uh, importantly, though, measures of core inflation did tick down again, and that does suggest that underlying inflationary pressures are continuing to ease. So uh, we continue to be moving in the right direction. <clears throat> um, the other thing I want to underline is that in the conduct of monetary policy, we do spend a lot of time looking and understanding what is going on in the United States. U.S. economy has a very big impact on the Canadian economy. We also watch the U.S. economy closely, particularly through the extraordinary period we've all been through in the last few years, because the more we understand what we have in common and our differences, the better we can learn from each other's experience. <clears throat> and let me just close on a few words uh, on just how integrated the Canadian U.S. economy is. And, and Randy, you, you highlighted some of the, the key facts. Uh, I, I would totally share your perspective. I think the, the economic relationship really is the model for mutually beneficial open trade and investment. 77% uh, of Canadian exports flow to the United States. Uh, and as you underlined, what, what less people know is that Canada is the United States' biggest export market. 17% uh, or as you said, almost 20% of US goods uh, head north to, the, to Canada. If you look at foreign direct investment, there is a similar two-way dynamic. Uh, in 2022, more than half of Canadian FDI went to the United States by, 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 large, uh, by far the largest share of our FDI. That was uh, roughly $43 billion. Uh, in the same year, $50 billion uh, of US FDI came to Canada. So it, it's a pretty balanced relationship. And I think what these, these numbers un underline is just how close that economic relationship is and how it works in both directions. And the final thing I'll say is when you look forward, we face many of the same structural challenges. Our labor forces are aging. Uh, there's going to be a big challenge with new technology, training, uh, and making sure we have the skill, skilled workers our economies needs. Uh, climate change is affecting both, of our, both our economies. We're both grappling with shifting trade and investment patterns globally. Uh, supply chains uh, across both our countries need to build more resilience. Conflicts internationally are increasing global uncertainty. And for all these reasons, uh, I am very glad we're having this discussion. We do have much in common. And Randy, as you underlined, when we work together, we can get a lot more done. Thank you. Jesus. Well, thanks. That's a great place to start. Chairman Powell, really interested in hearing your perspective. Another place to start is to say, why don't you call me Jay and call <laughs> Tiff. Okay, I know I do it behind the scenes. I'll do it in front okay. of the scenes too. Great. Um, so let me start by uh, thanking Randy and Bill and Xavi and Tiff for this. It's great to be here today. Um, I want to echo what Randy said about the mutually beneficial, respectful, great relationship we have with Canada, economically, culturally, uh, and uh, I'd also like to echo, uh, I thought Tiff did a great job talking about the similarities and differences uh, in our economy, our financial markets, the challenges we face in our policy stance. It's almost as though you somehow had a copy of that part of my remarks, Tiff. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that. But what I will do is talk, if I could, a little bit about the, um, the U.S. economy and, and where we find ourselves right now. So. As, as uh, Get ready. I think Randy pointed out, the performance of the U.S. economy over the past year has really been quite strong. Um, we had growth of more than 3% uh, last year as rebounding supply supported both robust growth and in spending and also uh, employment alongside a considerable decline in inflation. The more recent data show solid growth and continued strength in the labor market, but also a lack of further progress so far this year on returning to our 2% inflation goal. So I'll say a little bit about uh, our two mandate goals. NASDAQ that market dropping. Stability. Uh, as I mentioned, the labor market remains very strong. Payroll job gains have been strong over the first quarter, averaging just a tick above 275,000 per month. 
The unemployment rate has been below 4% for 26 consecutive months, That's which hasn't happened uh, in more than a half a century, uh, the longest streak of its kind. Strong man demand for workers has been met by a substantial increase in the workforce due both to rising labor force participation and a substantial increase in immigration, as indeed Canada has experienced as well. So even, by, with, even with this strength, uh, by many measures, our labor market has been moving into better balance over the past year. Uh, the ratio of job openings to unemployed workers was extremely elevated in 2021 and 22, has now moved back down to levels just above the pre-pandemic era. Surveys of workers and businesses indicate a normalizing labor market. So do the rates of both quits and hires. Uh, and uh, broader wage pressures also continue to moderate, albeit gradually. So the overall picture for the labor market is one of real strength, but gradual normalization. Turning to price stability, uh, our inflation mandate. Inflation, of course, declined quite significantly over the second half of last year, over the whole year, but particularly in the second half. But 12-month core PCE inflation, which is uh, one of the most important things we, we look at, is estimated to have been little changed in March over February at 2.8%, and the three and six month measures of inflation are actually above that level. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2% before it'd be appropriate to ease policy. Whoa, that's a you know, good we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings <laughs> that we had in the second half of last year. Uh, the recent data, uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence Whoa, and instead a, indicate that it's likely to Selling take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. <laughs> that said, we think policy is well positioned to handle the risks that we face. If, if higher inflation Below. does persist, Be we careful. can maintain the current level of restriction for as long as needed. At the same time, we have significant space to ease should the labor market unexpectedly weaken. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation so far, it's appropriate to allow restrictive policy further time to work and let the data and the evolving outlook guide us. No Come rate cuts may, soon. That's what I heard from that. We're strongly committed to returning inflation over time sustainably to 2%. Watch for a potential bounce. That Thank is you. I think that's a support really rate. important frame for our discussion today. Um, one of the things that I remarked on when I first got into public life was how Watch often I saw my international peers uh, as, I, as we moved around. And when I see the two of you on stage together, I know that often you uh, see each other at G7, at G20 meetings. And I think it would be quite interesting for the audience to understand you know, how collaboration happens or doesn't happen internationally, how central banks work together uh, or don't work together. So uh, you know, maybe I could ask you, Jay, to give a perspective on, on how, that, uh, how that happens from, from uh, from your vantage point. Sure, so um, to, to give you an idea, we do meet quite regularly. So uh, Tiff and I attend uh, two G7 min, uh, meetings per year for ministers, that's finance ministers and central bank governors. We. Oh my goodness. My bad. central no finance ministries so it's all central banking uh, stuff and you know it's it's economics it's financial regulation all those things we also come here to washington or every third year we go someplace else twice he's just talking about how often they they meet with one another but hey you guys can't get mad it's my hand my hand damaged has a mind of its own sometimes <laughs> essentially uh we the central bankers are are having an ongoing conversation about what's going on in their own economies and their own financial markets, their own regulatory world with each other. And we're also talking about the big global issues of the day, as you would expect. So uh, some of which are really the business of the elected government, not the business of the central bankers. But we, you know, we, we have that discussion. It's more or less ongoing. We're seeing each other all the time. Uh, they're very informative, these discussions. And they, they, they really are, for me anyway, part of the way that, that I get to thinking about what the right policy is for the United States is to hear uh, what is going on around the world, what, what, what's happening globally, and how are people thinking about that. So it's, it's very, very uh, useful, particularly though, given our close cultural, financial, and economic ties with Canada, those discussions are especially fruitful and important. And you know, I have regular conversations with Tiff. By the way, I do 
keep very close track of, of the actions of the Bank of Canada. I read TIFF's press conference transcripts carefully and uh, pay, pay close attention to that. Yeah, uh, TIFF market, did uh, mention the similarities and, and differences. Um, I'll say one more thing, which is we, we go to Basel, as I mentioned, five times a year. You're a long way from home, and there usually is, we're there for four or five nights, and they're usually one or two nights off. So we go looking for someone to have dinner with, and very frequently we wind up with the Bank of Canada delegation for, <laughs> who are really good and very funny and a, and a lot of fun together. So we have a very close relationship with the bank and great respect for that institution, as I'll, I'll have a little more to say about lately. One, one other thing I'll point out, though, uh, about our relationship is we did do, as Randy pointed out, our first monetary policy, first review of our monetary policy framework really ever. And we looked around. The Bank of Canada also does regularly. I think it's every four years. In any case, uh, we, we really looked to the Canadian model and other models of how to do that. We talked to people at the Bank of Canada about how their regular framework review went. So we, we really benefited from that. Um, so that's what I'll stop there. <clears throat> Tiff, similar perspective from Canada? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I'll just add a little bit on, on uh, you know, as Jay outlined, uh, certainly from my perspective, one of the best parts about this job is uh, we do, you know, the, inter the international community, the central banking community, it, it's not like a commercial bank where you're competing against your, the other bank. We're all in this together. And if we get it right, it, we all help each other. Uh, so th there, is, there is a considerable openness. And you know, as Jay outlined, I think there, there's, a few, there's a few different functions. Yes, we, obviously if you're in Canada, you know, we have our own group at the Bank of Canada that, that analyzes the US economy, forecasts the US economy. It's very important to Canada, but uh, you know, the Fed's group is a lot bigger. They got a lot more experience. Uh, hearing what the Fed has to say is incredibly valuable for us. The other thing we do, though, is it, it's, it's more than just the data and the forecasting. It's, it's thinking through the scenarios together. You know, what risks are on your mind, Jay? Uh, what do you think could go wrong? What are the scenarios? How, you know, how would we handle it if, if this happened, if that happened? Being able to put your heads together and think through the risks, the scenarios, the strategy. Um, there are also a number of really, I would say, sort of behind the scenes very central banky technical issues that you know nobody really thinks about except yeah, central bankers. Market getting but you know, what are the mechanics of QE? How do you exit from QT? How many settlement balances are we going to need to? Uh, you know, fortunately, those are things most people don't have to worry about. They are critically important for the implementation of of monetary policy uh, and that sort of plumbing working of the financial system. And you know, being able to talk to people who are thinking about these things as much as you are is hugely valuable. And then the last thing I will say is, you know, there's some things um, that we're only going to succeed if we do together. The obvious one would be financial supervision and regulation. You know, our, our financial systems globally are highly integrated. We were uh, deeply reminded of this in the global financial crisis. Uh, what happens in other countries affects all of us. Um, and money flows, money flows across borders. So, you know, we, we have to do that together uh, or it's not going to work. Well, maybe we can drill into that for a minute. Uh, you know, obviously we recognize that most of your work is focused on the domestic markets, but uh, in times of crisis, there's real challenge. As you mentioned in the COVID period, uh, the global financial crisis, uh, you know, that uh, you were engaged with TIFF earlier in a different stage of your career. And for me, it was remarkable, the number of, of interactions with counterparts around the world during those crises. So maybe a question to both of you is, you know, what, what kind of interaction happens during periods of crisis? Uh, what doesn't happen? It, are there things that we should be thinking about differently in order to prepare ourselves for those, for those challenging moments and making sure that the financial system is resilient? So, again, maybe over to you, uh, Jay, to uh, react to that and, and uh, hear your thoughts. Sure. So, um, you know, our economies, our financial markets, all of our institutions are, are deeply intertwined. And when, you, when there is a, a situation where there's serious stress, you need to get a global perspective. You need to get perspective around the world. And you, need, you have to do that very quickly. And, and we, of course, can move effect, quickly and effectively on the domestic front. But what the, the thing that you, you figure out in those times is that all the time you spent at Basel and at the G7 and G20 meetings, you know your colleagues, you, you know and trust and respect their judgment, and you don't have to go through that 
that phase of gaining trust in people. You, under, you understand each other, you speak the same language. So there's a lot of communication. The level of communication is pretty high anyway, but during crises, it goes, it goes very high. You're constantly talking to, I'm constantly talking to um, other central bankers around the world and also political leaders uh, in, in our government and that sort of thing. So that, that happens a lot. Um, uh, the sense of what you're doing, again, is mostly sharing information and ideas about what to do. There may be a proposal that, that people are looking at and you're talking about that. So it's, it's, it's very useful. Um, I say uh, one thing to point out is it's less about coordination than it is about, about talking and understanding it, it, for one reason, or at least it was during the pandemic. And that was because almost every country's interest rates were very close to zero when the pandemic hit. And so there wasn't space, there wasn't policy space for most economies, most central banks to do a big coordinated rate cut. We did cut very quickly to zero, but we were, I think we were higher than almost any other uh, uh, nation in terms of where our policy rate was. But um, anyway, it, there's, there's a lot of communication and, and those, those relationships that you built up really do uh, help at that point. Um, in terms of what we've, you asked about learning, what have we learned? You know, I, I think that the pandemic is going to teach a whole lot of lessons over time. I still think it's too early to say what they are with confidence. And, and I'll point out, look, at the, the pandemic has surprised us over and over again, most recently by, in the United States, the remarkably strong performance of the economy at a time when virtually all economists were expecting a recession. So I think if you'd ask for the lessons of the pandemic, a year and a half ago, you'd get a very different answer. Now, I think in I think in a year or so, we'll have a lot more answers. It's just it is a unique uh, set of circumstances, and we're still learning. I think, but we we will try to learn those lessons. Different point, I would say about the bank stresses. Another crisis, uh, at least here in the states, I do think we we can and have learned the lessons of the stress of of early, early last spring. And um, I would point to a couple things that we embraced pretty forthrightly. One was that supervision was not tightly focused on the right things, was not proactive enough, was not forceful enough. And we've tried to take steps to, to remedy that. I also think there will be some regulatory initiatives for banks of that size and with those characteristics uh, in time. So I, I do think those, those are lessons that, that, we, that we have learned. And from a Canadian perspective, similar lessons or different ones? Yes, I think there are similar lessons. Maybe I'll just give a couple of other examples. I'll just first, though, I will just underline. You know, when when a crisis hits, you're 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 faced with a situation. You have to make decisions, and you have very limited information. The other reality is, you have a pretty narrow window to act to be really effective. And for both those reasons, you know, being able to speak, you know, directly to Jay uh, to connect with our other colleagues, finding out what's happening in their jurisdiction, how are they thinking about it, what do they see as the options. It is hugely important in a crisis. Uh, and that it's a little more, though, than just information sharing. I mean, I think it helps us un avoid um, unintended consequences of our actions. Sometimes you do something and it works for most parties, but not one party, and in a crisis, you know, it's the weakest link that can take you down. So you, you, you've got to be careful. Uh, it also, I think, boosts confidence in the system. If we're acting in a, you know, in a way that is coherent together, it boosts confidence. It, it you know, it, it looks more like a plan than than a haphazard policy response. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, at the, I wasn't actually governor at the start of, of COVID. Jay was there, but certainly looking at it from the outside, the coordinated actions of, of major central banks to um, to you know, reopen fixed income markets, uh, you know, providing liquidity, providing market making of last resort in scale, uh, you know, it, re, it restarted, reopened core functioning markets. Uh, and by all doing it essentially at the same time and all working in scale, the whole global market restarted. If that had not happened, this crisis would have been a much deeper and more severe crisis. And then the, the other one I'll highlight is, is uh, coping with the inflation as we came out of COVID. Uh, you know, by, you know, by all uh, being resolute in our commitment to restoring price stability, by all matching our words with forceful action, raising rates rapidly, 
We did. We, we all helped each other. I mean, it, it helped reduce global inflation in goods, which was really the first part of the, the inflation surge. Uh, and it helped keep inflation expectations in all our countries better anchored. And I think it, it is a key ingredient in how we have all managed to get inflation down uh, a long way back with, without causing recessions in our economies. And the last point I'll just highlight is something you said. Um, occasionally, this, this uh, coordination is very explicit. So for example, at the time of the global financial crisis, there was a coordinated G7 interest rate cut I remember clearly because it happened at three o'clock in the morning in Canada, uh, which was, was a little bit of a technical challenge. Um, you know, but most of the time, it's not explicit coordination, but it is those conversations. It is that shared information. We have similar objectives, similar goals, similar tools, and we're sharing information, and that leads to a coordinated response. Well, maybe you could spend a little bit more time on that from the, the Canada U.S. perspective. So Randy mentioned in his opening comments uh, the idea that when you're in Canada, you're living next to an elephant. And uh, I think a lot of Canadians would assume that, uh, that Canadian policy has to take into account U.S. policy. So maybe could you give us a perspective on how important that is for, uh, for your deliberations and uh, you know, how that factors into decision making, the U.S. approach? Uh, well, look, I think it, it's pretty clear that the, our, our U.S. economic relationship is by far our most important relationship. Our economies are highly integrated. You know, 35% of our GDP is exports, and 75% of that goes to the United States. So, multiple, you know, that, that's a big chunk of our GDP. Um, our financial markets are also very integrated. In fact, yesterday I was in, in New York, uh, and when you go to New York, you are just reminded how integrated our markets are. I, I was at the uh, New York Stock Exchange, and uh, you know, all over are you know, cross-listed Canadian companies on on, on many of the screens. Um, our our financial systems are very integrated. Our banks have uh, most of our large banks have uh, operations in the United States. Our pension funds are big investors uh, in the United States. Um, so we do spend a lot of time understanding what's going on, trying to understand what's going on in the United States, and looking at the implications for Canada. There are, though, you know, I, I highlighted in my opening remarks some differences. I, the, another important difference I didn't focus on is, you know, both our economies have big manufacturing sectors, big service sectors, uh, large commodity sectors, but the commodity sector in the Canadian economy is quite a bit bigger uh, than it is in the United States. Oil and gas, agriculture, forestry, mining, um, <clears throat> fishing, 40% uh, of our exports, 13% of our GDP. And the commodity cycle can be quite different. And um, we have a flexible exchange rate that does help absorb uh, the differences. Uh, and I think it's an important reason why historically, sometimes our monetary policy is a do, do differ. Our cycles are often quite similar and certainly through COVID, we had a similar shock and a pretty similar cycle and our monetary policy has been quite similar. There have been other episodes, though, where particularly if the commodity cycle is different, you'll see monetary policy diverge somewhat from the United States. There are limits to how far it can diverge. But as I emphasized, um, we, we have our own currency. We have a flexible exchange rate, and that, that, allows, that absorbs the differences to allow us to gear monetary policy to what we need to do in Canada. And Jay, from your perspective, obviously, the U.S. has an outsized role in, in the global economy. And I guess we'd be interested in understanding how much time do you deliberate on what your actions will have uh, as reactions, and how much do you think about you know what's happening with global markets as you come to your conclusions? So I'll just, I'll start by saying that each central bank serves a domestic mandate, which is in the case of Fed is using our tools to achieve maximum employment and price stability for the benefit of of the people we serve. So it's a domestic mandate, but in the case of the United States we fully realize and appreciate that our decisions can have significant effects on, not just on Canada, but on, or Mexico, but on countries around the world. Uh, and that's all the more so because the dollar is the reserve, the principal reserve currency, which strengthens the transmission of our policy through the global economy. So we also know that, <clears throat> that those effects, effects on global demand 
um, from our, uh, you know, from our policy changes can have a, an effect on the United States as well. That can can rebound to the United States. So we're very very aware of of all of that. And for one thing, we try we try to be very transparent and predictable, given the flow given the flow of data and events. I mean, you have to move quickly sometimes, but we do realize we have a special obligation to be predictable and transparent, and that that benefits us in doing that as well. So international spillovers, of course, are an important consideration. We do. I don't know about you guys, but it seemed like the first 10 to 15 minutes of this live stream was the only part where they actually talked about um, monetary policy in the actual United States and not just about our relationships with Canada. Um, I'm going to close out my live stream here. And the reason why is because it looks like the market has already reacted. And what Jerome Powell said, just to summarize it and feel free to rewatch so you can see exactly what it is that he said. He said that we are not at the point of where the Federal Reserve can justify cutting interest rates. That as of right now, they will have to remain the course in waiting for that economic data to support it. So to me, that was not showing any signs of confidence that by the next FOMC rate decision, the Federal Reserve was going to cut interest rates. So I think it's very easy to understand that based off of recent economic data uh, and even just based off of his comments that inflation or, or interest rate cuts are not going to be here anytime soon, as long as inflation continues to rise. Uh, and that seemed to be the case based off of not only his sentiment, but his comment as well and how the market reacted. The market did end up making new lows. Again, this is QQQ, which is the NASDAQ ETF. The market's not aggressively selling off. Uh, it's not anything like it was yesterday, right? We aggressively sold off yesterday. We're pretty much just trading sideways. Like, this is, let me just wrap this up by saying the same thing that I said to my LPP team. You could choose to trade the low points of 430 or the high points of 432 for QQQ, right? And how, how that correlates on over to TQQQ, 100%. You could choose to trade that. But the big money, the big move, right? If you're trying to focus on a little bit more of a quality trade would therefore be if markets do begin to recover and we break above the EMA and begin to work our way back up to, you know, 440, that would be a much more significant move from like 432 all the way back up to 440. Or if we break support because all of a sudden things are getting things are getting worse overseas with war. Or if, you know, Feder um, if Jerome Powell announces that, you know, whatever the case might be, any type of monetary policy that might cause the market to sell off. We're just not getting any of that. And the market's been very stubborn for the past four months and nothing continues to change that. So we can continue to watch the market pretty much trade sideways as again, people are commenting right now. Oh, it's going to dump on you. It's going to dump on you. Trust me. I've been waiting for the market to dump for the past two months, but guess what? It finds any and every reason to recover. Yeah, it has a little sell-offs. And if you like trading those, all power to you, right? You're an adult. You can do whatever it is that you want. But overall, there's no break of pattern here. It's done this. It's traded these lows. It's traded these highs. It's traded these lows. It's traded these highs. So if you want to trade within that range, then great. But there is no break of pattern here. We are not breaking above and actually recovering. We are not breaking below and actually selling off. There is no active pattern today other than we're just consolidating and it seemed like with what he said so far has not influenced any form or any reason on why there should be a break of pattern now if something is said later within those live and that within that live stream then maybe again we can see the market beginning to recover or to sell off but as of right now i see the market trading sideways i see this kind of more of a waste of time uh and i just don't want to waste my day hearing these people talk about what our you know, uh, similarities are between two countries that will have no effect to the overall big picture and big move of this overall NASDAQ market. So again, you guys can uh, look up the link. It's under the Federal Reserve calendar um, and it's very easy to find. So under the Federal Reserve calendar, you guys can uh, search up this link or you can just send me a DM via Discord or Instagram and I can send it on over to you. And look at that, the NASDAQ market all of a sudden for all those that said, oh, it's going to crash on you, it's going to crash on you. Now it's beginning to recover again. If you want to continue to trade these lows and these highs, then great. But understand there is no break of pattern above or below. So please just do not waste your time um, if it's not something that you actually want to do, right? Quality over quantity. Um, I do appreciate your guys' time. I hope to see you for tomorrow's live trading session. For all those that are tuning on in, again, if you want the ability to be actually be able to watch me trade, you get to see my entries, you get to see my exits. But most importantly, you get to hear my thought process behind every trade I take. I am focusing and really waiting for direction to be more clear. But if you 
signed up today, you can watch me trade live as soon as tomorrow. And if you want to tune on in, it's the second link in the description of this video down below. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to comment or send me a direct message via Instagram. Other than that, I appreciate you guys' time. Don't forget to subscribe. And like always, let's make sure that we end the year on a green note. Take care, team.